Hello, and welcome to Union Tabernacle. We are so excited that you are joining us in our virtual environment today. If you haven't done so already, please like our Facebook page so that you will receive a notification when we go live. Also, share this worship service and tag your friends and family so that they can join you for worship. You can also follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We love to connect with you here at UTAB. So in the comments section, go ahead and tell us where you're watching from and who's watching with you. Before service starts, we want you to know what type of church we are. Our mission is to impact the community and the world with cross-centered ministry. We do that by meeting the needs of others through outreach and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are a purpose-driven church built on the five purposes of ministry, evangelism, discipleship, worship, and fellowship. We place great value in the next generation, and we are a church that loves to give. Welcome to UTAB. Yeah. 
To my UTAP family and all those who have joined us online this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to UTAP Live. We are so glad that you have taken the time to join us for worship on this Palm Sunday morning. God has graciously given us his word and as we begin our worship services today I want to go back and read for us the prophetic words of the prophet Zechariah 400 plus years before Jesus's entry into the world Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 says rejoice greatly O daughter of Zion Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a coat, the fowl of a donkey. We see the fulfillment of this particular prophetic writing in Matthew chapter 21 verses 1 through 8 we call it the triumphal entry now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethage to the Mount of Olives then Jesus sent two disciples saying go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a coat with her untie them and bring them to me if anyone says anything to you you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying say to the daughter of Zion behold your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey on a donkey on a coat on a fowl a beast of burden the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them they brought the donkey and the coat and put them on cloaks and he said and he sat on them 
Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Today, although we are in this virtual space, I wanted to make sure that we understand that every facet of scripture has been fulfilled, that scripture interprets scripture. And as we celebrate today, I want you to do me a favor. Type in the comment section, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. As we celebrate our great and awesome King Jesus, come on in where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on. Let's go to church. Praise the Lord, you tap. Hallelujah. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you ought to stop and lift up the name of Jesus with us.
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we truly lift your name on high. Bow with me. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. From the place where the sun rises to the place where it goes down, Lord, your name is worthy to be praised. There is nobody like you. God, we love you and we thank you for this another day, another opportunity to look together into your word. We pray that as we open the scriptures, Lord, you would open our hearts and open our minds to comprehend what your word says. Forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness so that you can use me for your glory and for our good. Have your way even through this virtual worship experience to meet someone at their point of need. Help the word to live in them and through them. Save some sinner. Encourage some saint. But Lord, may you, our Savior, be most satisfied. It's in the strong and certain name of Jesus Christ. We pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Good morning. I want to take this moment, this time, to welcome each and every one of you to our Palm Sunday worship service. We are worshiping virtually every other week, and we certainly would love to be in this place waving our palms and shouting Hosanna to the highest because of the celebration of the entrance of our great king who came to bring us peace. But we're in this space and we want to continue in our sermonic series. But I wanted to make sure to say to you that this day represents Jesus' triumphal entry into the, into the city as he made his way towards the cross. But we are continuing our sermonic series through the book of Galatians as we as a church are refocused on the gospel we continue in the closing lines of chapter number three we've sort of come to a rather interesting space as Paul in this closing section really summarizes the great benefit that comes from faith in Jesus Christ in creating freedom from the law. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 through 29 reads on this wise. Stand with me as we read the word of God together. Galatians chapter 23, verses... I'm, Chapter 3, verse 23 through 29. And here's what my Bible reads in the English Standard Version of the Bible. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Once again, Verse 24 for emphasis says, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. And I want to preach the second half of last week's sermon with the same title, Law 
in order. I would that you'd pray for me as I attempt to teach and preach the word of God. Though I'm in an empty room, I pray that this word will find you well wherever you are. Law in order, part two. January 1st, 1863 is a rather memorable day in U.S. history. For it is the day when Abraham Lincoln signed into law the Emancipation Proclamation, essentially declaring all slaves to be free. The document was supposed to endow these slaves with freedom and equality along with any and every other American the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. While the signing of this document was significant, it still did not nor has not provided equality of all in this, the yet to be United States. There is still racial prejudice, tension, police brutality against people of color all over this nation. There is still a great division in our yet to be United States of America. Recently, the issues of police brutality and unfair justice system that seems to be dead set against the freedom of black people are uh, has highlighted the fact that the Emancipation Proclamation, while making it illegal to treat others unequally, has not enforced those laws in this day. I join with the words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his most famous speech as he was standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial. He said that in spite of the fact that the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed, here we are now, 180 years later, and the Negro in America is still not free. My brothers and sisters, the bad news in our country does not transfer to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Galatians, here Paul, has given those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ with a freedom and an equality far greater than that which the Emancipation Proclamation was ever supposed to give in the first place. You see, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, it sets you free. Now, Lord have mercy. That freedom is entitled to all no matter what race you are, no matter what denomination you are. The fact that you have been saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone means that we are all with respect to the gospel. You see, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, it set you free from the bondage and the responsibilities of the Mosaic law in order to secure blessing and freedom and ultimately salvation from the Lord. You see, you can't live well enough in order to secure uh, God's blessing. You can't live well enough to earn salvation. You can't live well enough. And so what Paul suggests in this text is that we all need to make absolutely certain that we embrace the freedom that only the gospel can provide. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He has established the church in Galatia that was comprised primarily of Gentiles who had received the gospel with eagerness. He believed that they were doing okay or 
running well, he would later say. But after he left Galatia, he learned that a group had slip, slipped in among the Christians and tried to cause them to practice Jewish ritualism. Particularly, Paul was concerned about their requirement for circumcision. These Judaizers, as they were known, were Christians who believed that it was essential for Christians who believed in Jesus to also practice Jewish law. In this letter to the Galatians, Paul has criticized the Galatians for their turn away from the gospel, which they had been clearly taught and has pronounced a curse on those who have seduced them to observe these Jewish practices. Paul has already confronted those who ought to know better, namely Peter and Barnabas. In the earlier part of this chapter, Paul asked the Galatians, who bewitched you? He, 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 he asked them, who has fooled you into believing something other than what you know to be the truth? And did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing faith? He quoted Hebrew scripture to show that the purpose of the law was to guide Israel until the Messiah or faith came. His point was that the law, while necessary, was never intended to be permanent. You see, Paul started out and we preached, there is no other way to be saved than through faith in Jesus Christ. He quoted Genesis 15, 6, to note that the father Abraham was counted as righteous not because of his works, but because of his belief or faith. And said, know therefore that those who are of faith, the same are children of Abraham. He is going to lean in on this particular contextual reference here in our passage as he closes this chapter. Then the following week, our good friend and brother, Pastor Jeremy Meeks, preached a family tradition. He blended Deuteronomy chapter 27, 26, and 28 and 58 to show that those who live by the law are under a curse because no one is able to keep the law faithfully. He cited Habakkuk 8. I'm Habakkuk 2 and 4, to show that the righteous person lives by faith, not by the law. He quoted Deuteronomy 21 and 23 to support his argument, Paul that is, that Christ redeemed us by becoming a curse for us. And that's where we preached the blessing of a curse wherein he also used as reference Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. He said that the law was given because of transgressions until. He, he lets us know that it was only in effect until faith came. He said if there had been a law given which could make alive most assuredly righteousness would have been by the law. The implication being that, in fact, the law was not able to give us life. And therefore, the first part to this two-part series is that we must learn to put the law in order. He went on to say that the promises of Abraham were fulfilled not by the law, but by faith, in Jesus Christ to those who believe. And here today, I want to submit as the second part of this sermonic series is our faith in Christ makes all believers equal recipients and heirs to the promise. The text breaks down in three 
parts. We'll look at the time reference or movement in the passage in order to see how Paul is getting at this future promise. First, he tells us to look back at the past custody of the law. Then he moves from past custody to our present unity that we have in Christ. And then we'll close by looking at the future beneficiaries of the promise. Let, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can walk you through it. Now before faith came, verse 23 says, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified. You see, before faith came, we were held captive. He uses this interesting language of captivity or bondage. But then he loosens the screws a bit in verse 24 by shifting the word that he uses for our current, their former condition to be held as a, by a guardian. The law was our guardian. Here Paul uses an illustration that was probably familiar to his readers. The, ch the child guardian. In Roman and in Greek households, well-educated slaves were employed in order to take the children from home to school and watch over them during the day and then bring them home and help them with their homework. This would continue from adolescence all the way through maturity. Sometimes they would teach the children. Sometimes they would protect and prohibit the children from harming themselves. And sometimes they would even be given the responsibility to discipline the children. This is what Paul means by guardian, or the actual word here is schoolmaster. But please, do not read this word into our modern context because it's, Paul is saying that the guardian, that the law was much more than the teacher. The guardian was a person who watched over the child night and day until that child reached maturity. There was no time off the clock for the guardian. The guardian's responsibility, again, was to make sure that the child moved from adolescence to maturity well. The translation of this Greek word would give our word pedagogo, which literally means a child conductor. By using this illustration, I think, Paul is saying several things about the Jews and their law. First, he is saying that the Jews were not born through the law, but rather they were brought up by the law. The slave was not the child's father. He was the child's guardian and disciplinarian. So the law did not give life to Israel. It only regulated how they lived. The Judaizers taught that the law was necessary for life and righteousness. And Paul's argument shows that they were wrong that the law could not make sure that you lived righteous. The law could not put you in proper standing before God. But the second thing I think Paul says is even more important, that the work of the guardian was preparation for the child to make it to maturity. Once the child came of age, he no longer needed the guardian. So the law, get it, was preparation for the nation of Israel until faith came, until the promised seed came, until Jesus arrived. The ultimate goal of God's program was his coming. But before this, faith, Christ, grace, the nation was, get it, imprisoned, held captive, held down, held back. They were guarded 
under the law. The word here used means to keep or to guard. It could have been negative, but it was not. The custody that we were held bound by was protection from us living as a pagan. It was necessary to communicate to us what God's character, what God's requirement, what righteous living was to be like. The word that was used that meant shut up together or enclosed together as sheep would be shut up in by a sheep herder or by their shepherd rather in a sheep pen for the night with the shepherd who would stand guard over them for safekeeping. Paul here is saying that before Jesus came, God gave Israel the law to keep them from straying into danger that will ultimately lead them away from God. It showed them where the lines were so that they would try to live according to it. But their ability to or inability to stay within the lines only pointed to a greater need for Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ came, we learned last week that he took the law off the clock. But that's the custody that was presented to us. Our past custody was from the law, but, but our present unity. Verses 25 through 27 speaks of our present unity in Christ. We are no longer under guardianship of the law. In Christ, we are all sons of God by faith. We have been baptized into and clothed in Christ. Thus, we are all one in Christ. This is our present unity in Christ. Once a child has grown to maturity, Paul suggests, the teacher, the guardian, the, the one who is watching over the child is no longer needed. It's no longer necessary that, that, that once, if I could use in our vernacular, once the baby, once the parent comes home from date night, the, the, the person who has been given charge of the child to watch, oh, we call him a babysitter. Uh, the babysitter is no longer needed once the child parent has come home. You see, mature people will probably retain an affection for that guardian. They, they have built a relationship with that guardian. They've come to trust that guardian. They've come to know that guardian. And they have a, a, a feeling of love and appreciation for what the guardian. But no one, no matter how good you enjoyed the guardian or the babysitter, how much fun they were, no matter what they were like, when the parent comes home, when, when, the, when the parent releases the guardian from their duty, you are no longer obligated to obey that guardian. This is what Paul is getting at. So it is with our Christian faith. We respect the law, and perhaps we even love or revere the law because we find wisdom in the Mosaic law. But we are no longer to look to the law for salvation. We are not to look to the law in order to be saved. We are not to look to the law in order to gain righteousness before God. For you are all, Paul says, children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Elsewhere, Paul uses the same word here that we have been adopted into the family. We have become sons of God. This literally means that we, we have been placed as sons or have been adopted into the family of 
God. As, as a result of the law bringing us to the point where, G, where we recognize that we need Jesus in order to be saved, we are now adopted through faith in Christ into the family of God. Similarity between the Greek words of sons and children of God is interesting. Both point to a privileged and intimate relationship, whether you are sons or children of God. The, the same word, it speaks the highlights of the intimate, close relationship that we can have with God. And no one can give us that except Jesus Christ. That the, the law could not give us a close relationship with God. It only highlighted that we can never be right enough to be called children of God. But through faith in Jesus, we have all been placed into the family of God. For as many of you as were, he uses this, this term baptized into Christ, having put on Christ. Let me work here. The, the Greek word here means to put on a garment. We, we have been baptized and then we had put on. First of all, we are baptized. This is an outward expression of an inward change. It is our public identification with Christ and with other believers. We need to make sure that we understand that we are not saved by baptism. That baptism is only our coming out party as Christians. It is to, to symbolize our oneness, our unity with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. When Paul talks about putting on Christ, however, he uses a clothing metaphor to describe a transformation that God has wrought in their lives. While clothing might seem external as contrasted by the change of heart Paul uses this clothing metaphor we have to put on Christ that we have been baptized and become a part of the body of Christ we have been baptized and been placed in Christ 55 times in Paul's epistles he uses this term in Christ and we are to be placed in we are in the body of Christ this is a place of unity of equality Paul is pointing towards this unity and equality because he is again addressing the Judaizers separation between Jews and Gentiles and Paul is saying hey we have all been baptized into Christ and we are to all put on Christ. People who have put on Christ are new people. They have been redeemed. They have been forgiven. People whose actions and demeanor has changed to reflect the fact that God has given them a new heart. I got Bible for that just in case you need it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Paul is clear here about what we are to be, that just because you've been saved by grace through faith in Christ does not give you the freedom to live however you want. You should live as a resurrected new Christian who has been saved by faith in Jesus. Paul traces this putting on of Christ to baptism. He deals with this in more detail in Romans chapter number 6. You remember, Paul says in Romans 6, 1 through 5, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. God forbid. May it never happen. We would die to sin. We who died to sin, how could we live in, in it any longer? Or don't you know that all we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized 
into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him through baptism to death. That just like Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we will also be part of his glorious resurrection. Lord, have mercy. That because we have been identified with Christ and placed into the body of Christ, then we ought to live as one. We ought to live in unity. And he goes on to move to the third and final portion of this wonderful closing section of this book to let us know that those who have present unity because of our past custody can now look forward to being future beneficiaries. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all, hear it now, one in Christ Jesus. In this verse, Paul mentions some of the many divisions that separate us. Jews and Greeks, particularly in this past, slaves and free, male and female, white and black. Baptist and Catholic, we all try to set all the ways in which we should be separated. Paul says that when you are baptized, placed in, and put on Christ, you have become one. Thusly, all are equal at the foot of the cross. That Jesus has equaled the field for all of us, making it possible for us all as sons and children of God to come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy. Jesus has made it possible for us to be clean enough to get into God's presence, not because of how we live but because of his obedient sacrifice that made it possible for his righteousness to be placed on our account. Thank God for Jesus that we are all one, that we are all equal, that no matter whether you're American or Asian, whether you're African or Mexican, whether you are Colombian uh, or Cuban, it doesn't matter that we are all one in Christ. This is, this is one of the best things about my new uh, employment opportunity where I work for and are part of the teaching team, the Chicago course on preaching. As a result of that, I'm on a weekly, bi-weekly conference call with people from all over the world. When you look at my screen on the Zoom call from people all over the world, you discover the, the beauty and magnitude of what Paul is saying here. That on the call, there are people from all different walks of life, all different economic backgrounds, all different educational uh, acumen. They, they, they all are from different places, but we serve one God, and we are all saved by grace through faith in Christ and because of it we are all equal I like that because too many times do we as particularly in our country try to draw lines and establish levels to, to make one more spiritual or less spiritual than another no one should be giving anyone any requirements for salvation uh, that are not aligned with the word of God in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul said that Christ Jesus is our peace, who made both one and broke down the wall of partition, the dividing wall. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers, thank you Jesus, and foreigners, but you, have, you are fellow citizens and with the saints and of the household of God. We are a part of the same family. We are all in the same household. We are all given equal access to everything that belongs to the Father. That all that he intended for his son Jesus Christ, that we too now, because of our identification with him, will have equal access 
to it all. At our best, we see this unity in our church. I'm so grateful and thankful for the ability to pastor such wonderful people where we have multiracial, multicultural, multi-ethnic members of our fellowship, particularly now that we are online uh, for 90% of the time. Our, our reach has grown. Our congregation becomes more diverse. When you look on now Sunday morning, it's no longer just a black man standing behind this desk. Sometimes you'll have a white man standing behind this desk. There will be times when you will see a Hispanic or you'll see an African man standing behind this desk because we are all one in Christ charged with the responsibility of preaching the gospel to those who need to hear it. Our church shows diversity. And because of our diversity and oneness in Christ, we display Christian unity. Sometimes we, we focus too much on what separates us and not enough on what brings us together. We need to make sure that we understand that our future beneficiary is that we are, get it now, joint heirs with Christ and Abraham. Paul is talking about Abraham and Abraham's seed. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I'm at the end now. The, the people of Israel were Abraham's offspring. They, he was, they were Abraham's descendants, and Paul masterfully now has used their most famous family relative in order to show them that we are not to live according, we are not saved according to the law because Abraham wasn't saved according to the law. Abraham was saved by faith and had righteousness imputed to his account because of his obedience to God, even though that which God had promised, it was hard to believe. And he still had faith in God. And because Abraham was saved by faith in God and given the promise of eternal life, then you and I, too, will be saved by faith in God. That's what Paul has been arguing for the entirety of this book up until this point that there is no other way for you to be saved. That does not mean that we just throw the law out, but you got to put the law in order, that the law's responsibility was to show us our total dependence on Jesus Christ for salvation because we could never live right enough to be saved ourselves. The people of Israel were Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. God promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, lest I go there one more time. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. All of the families of the earth will be blessed in you. But now that the Messiah has come, Christians have become Abraham's seed and heirs according to this very same promise. An heir, get it, is a person who has been given the legal right to an inheritance. Jewish law regulated these inheritance, giving two shares to the firstborn son and one share to the other sons, according to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17. But Listen, I want to tell you that, that, that Jesus is, the, is God's only begotten son. He is his firstborn, and Israel was, was his chosen people. But you and I now can look forward to being joint heirs with Christ. The book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, Paul says that we have become heirs and joint heirs with Christ, the result of God adopting us into his family. We have been placed into the family of God, and you and I can look forward to the equal access, equal love, equal benefit 
of being sons of our great and awesome God. That's uh, so why I like the book of, of Romans, which highlights many of the same things that the book of Galatians. It has even been suggested that Galatians is the little brother to big brother Romans. Listen to what Romans says in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. I'll read it to you so you can shout about your inheritance. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live according to the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This is my verse here. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. That when we all get to heaven, Jesus will be the reason that we make it to his feet. And we will have the responsibility of joining with the chorus of angels, crying out day and night, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord Almighty. I'm glad today that our identification with Christ makes us equal with one another and the recipients of the greatest promise that we will be recipients of eternal life. One of the most familiar passages of scripture in all the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish. Here is the greatest beneficiary promise that we will receive, that we will have everlasting life. And I'm grateful today that the law brought us to Jesus, but that Jesus will get us into heaven. Let's pray. God, we love you and thank you for your word. We thank you for the precious promises of Scripture. We pray, God, that you will save some sinner in this moment who has yet to place their faith in Jesus Christ, who has been trying to live right enough to get back into the church. Help them to know that all they have to do is to call on the name of the Lord and to be identified with Christ, thus making them equal recipients of the promise that was given to Abraham. God, I just pray that we would all learn to live in alignment with the word, but not in order to be saved, but because we have been saved. Save some sin of this day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you have not Confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The greatest benefit that you could receive for all eternity is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That we can be made righteous before God simply by confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And believing in your heart that God has raised his son from the grave. And you can be saved from the penalty of your sin. But one day we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. But until then, we're going to have to struggle in this body, making our way towards the Lord. But please understand, if you fall short, it will not rob you of salvation. But you've got to call on the name of the Lord first and believe that he is the Son of God. I pray that this word finds you well and that you will be saved this day above all else. Thank you for watching. God bless.
So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life and yes you too can have everlasting life today and that's what we offer you we offer you an opportunity to make Christ your personal Lord and Savior to accept him in your heart and how do you do this you admit that you are a sinner believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and you shall be saved Saved from what? Saved from the penalty of sin, saved from the power of sin, and one day ultimately saved from the presence of sin. List in the comments below. Let us know that you've made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, or you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And someone from our hospitality ministry will get in contact with you to share with you and to welcome you into our family. Thank you so much. This month we are marching through Proverbs. Every day we'll be reading one chapter from the Book of Wisdom, and then by the end of the month you should have read the entire book. Please join us in this challenge. 8 a.m. on Sunday mornings, please join us for our Facebook Live 
Rewind service. We will be playing the sermon from the previous week. Discipleship Hour starts at 9 a.m. via Zoom with our Christian Education Department. The spring theme is Prophets Faithful to God's Covenant. Wrap up your Sunday with morning worship starting at 1015. We will be meeting in person every first and third Sunday. Registration is required. Don't miss the shift. Monday, March 29th starts our Holy Week fast through Good Friday. We would also like to use that week for community outreach to give Easter baskets to students at Mays Academy. Donations can be made via Giveify under Community Outreach by Good Friday.